Let's read Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, as we introduce this thought of a continual prayer vigil today. Paul writes to the Colossians, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. Paul was a prisoner here that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. As we said, we'll emphasize today the importance of prayer in a message, again, that is entitled A Continual Prayer Vigil. We focus today primarily on verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Now, I'm neither a betting man nor a prophet, But if I had to guess, I'd assume that over the past week in particular, you have been more alarmed than you have been in some time. Now, you know that we don't talk about politics here in the pulpit and we don't preach, you know, any sort of political rhetoric, whether it be American or any other nation, because we are servants of Christ, our King is Jesus, and we preach the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's a kingdom that has existed since the days of the Lord Jesus that God established himself and it will exist in this world until the end of time. He will deliver it up and it will continue with him in its fullness, in his direct presence as their king for all of eternity. This kingdom is at hand and we enter into its gates today with singing. We have a better thing to talk about than politics. But you and I would have to be the proverbial ostrich with our head in the sand to not have been alarmed at some of the things that we saw on television this week. Do you agree? If you have no idea what I'm talking about, praise God you spent the week somewhere in a mountain alone. If you're like me, I imagine a good portion of your week was spent watching the news You were probably concerned. I've quoted recently a number of times the words of Herodotus just on the subject of war that no one is so foolish as to prefer war over peace because in war, fathers bury their sons, and in peace, sons bury their fathers. And simply what that has reference to is in war, people die. And it's not the aged of society that usually die in war, but it's the young men that go off to fight those battles. Your 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds. Now, those of you that signed up to fight in our military, you know what that looks like. You, you know loved ones, that people that you saw and loved and knew friends that were injured in war, and maybe you might know people who didn't make it back from war. War is often said to be hell. Interestingly enough, I saw a quote from the series MASH. How many of you remember that, that series? And Hawkeye, as he was operating them, someone made the comment that war is often compared to hell, but he asked the chaplain, there are people that are in hell, what are they? And the chaplain replies, well, I, I suppose they're sinners. And he says, but the people in war, oftentimes that suffer from war, they're innocent people that simply had no choice but to face that which has befallen them. And that was shared just in a graphic online, but it really strikes home to this thought at how brutal and terrible military conflict and skirmish is in the world. By the way, we are people who follow the Prince of Peace. It's said of the wicked that the way of peace they have not known. Christ came to, in some sense, yes, bring a sword, but that's in a religious and a doctrinal sense, dividing between the clean and the unclean, and the following of Christ does invite persecution in the lives of those that are faithful. But understand that this is the way of peace. Our desire in the world is to be that people live at peace one with another. We ought not relish in violence or war through bloodlust or excitement. Understand what we see over in the other side of the world is not entertainment. It's not a ball game, but People are really dying, and as much of a powder keg as it is, the situation in Europe right now, 
being nothing to wink at, just a simple spark could flare up global skirmish and death and suffering that we haven't seen in nearly 100 years. I would encourage you to go to the Veterans Memorial downtown. I've played several concerts there with concert bands and brass ensembles, but a very depressing part of that monument, it's a, a semicircle and it has a timeline of American warfare and as it lists the timelines of each individual war that America fought in, it lists the number of casualties and every one of those numbers is a person that died. Somebody's son or somebody's husband, somebody's father, a person who gave up their life in the defense of our way of life here in this country. War's not entertainment, and as such, I, I know that you and I are troubled by that. I'm very troubled at what I saw on the news this week. It's literally a powder keg awaiting a, a single spark before warfare flares up through this entire world, and those of us that have children that are old enough to go to war and fight, it, it hits us a little harder in the stomach than it might a lot of people. We're all concerned about our way of life being affected. But if you, have, if you have a young man in, in your family that's drafting age, you think about it a little bit differently than you would otherwise. Some of you remember when the draft was the thing. Brother Hewlin and I have talked about that from when he was a young man. That's a way of life that we no longer know in this country, but it could return in a moment's notice. I remember when I was 18 and I had to register for the draft, something that we still register for as young men. To say that the last few days have been alarming is probably an understatement, isn't it? It's concerning, to say the least. It's nothing to wink at. When God's people look out at things such as that, a 9-11, how many of you here in this room can't remember 9-11 because you were so young? All these children. You look out at this room and all these kids, they don't remember the planes hitting the buildings. I was working as a land surveyor in a subdivision, surveying a plot of land that was going to be mortgaged off. And all of a sudden we hear words on the radio of planes or something in, flying into buildings, rockets, we didn't know. And the, our hearts began to sink at the thought that our country might be under attack, literally here on our own soil. I was often compared to Pearl Harbor, another such event as, as that, that most people today were not around for. I wasn't around for that. When you see something like that happen, maybe put it a little more recent, when you see news of a novel virus that begins to spread through the world or political uncertainty or violence in the streets because people are angry and they begin to be violent and riot flip cars and catch them on fires, knock holes through windows and loot stores. That's all very, very unsettling. When a child of God sees something like that, I believe something in us makes us want to ask the question, what can I do? What can I do? Can I directly intervene and take a madman invading another country by the shoulders and shake him and say, what are you thinking? Stop in the name of God what you are doing. I can't do that. Do I have access to any president, any king, any dictator? I don't. I don't have access to the president of the United States I don't have access to the governor of Alabama. How many of you would like access even to the local politicians? You know, there's a lot of Christians today that don't even have access to their pastor. We, we live in this celebrity world where there are 15 different channels you have to go through before you talk to anybody who's perceived to be the top of any organization, church, business, or government. I don't have access to the leaders of nations around this world what can I do? Can I go and help repel a, a military invading another country? I can't do that. As I was driving home from taking one of the kids to a, a class this week, I remembered some of the fiction that I watched as a little boy. And, you know, comic book superhero movies have really come a long way with special effects and CGI. And I love 
watching Avengers movies and Star Wars movies and, and movies such as that. But when I was a little boy, the superhero that every little kid wanted to be was Superman. How many of you remember Christopher Reeve starring as Superman? He wasn't all jacked up on steroids. He was just a decent looking man, and I mean decent in the sense of morality, a wholesome superhero that little boys wanted to be like. And I would put on a red cape and my blue Superman pajamas and run around in the yard with my arms out like I was Superman. I remembered one of the movies where nukes are launched and he rushes up into the sky and he gets them and he relocates them and takes them somewhere else and saves the day. And I thought, man, how I would love to have the power of Superman. I could just go fly to the other side of the world, knock through the wall, take the leader maybe three or 4,000 feet in the air and give him a pep talk as he hung there by my hand. But you know, I can't do that. I'm not Superman. I'm not invincible. I can't fly. I don't have superhuman strength. You and I, as the world sees it, we have no power to impact the situation around us. But I want you to understand that that is patently false. You and I can and the purpose of today's message, a continual prayer vigil, and I'm going to emphasize that point many times, is going to be an encouragement for you and I to do that which we can do. What can I do about the potential for world war, about an invading military, about a pandemic, about violence in the streets? What can you and I actually do that affects human reality as we know it for the better. You and I can hit our knees. You and I can pray. Now you might think, well, gee, a lot of good that does. I, I want to tell you that people in this country today have such a cynical, unbiblical view, even Christians of prayer, that they will do everything they can and pray as a last-ditch effort. But prayer is the first line of defense for a child of God when things in this world fly out of control. Now, as we'll see today, and this is going to be a message that once we get past the preface and we're looking at scriptures, there's a lot of points that I'm going to give you, and I can't spend a lot of time on any of these passages. But you're going to see that prayer is the thing that we can all do and not only is it something that we can do, it's the first thing that we ought to do when things such as what has been occurring over the past week begins to happen in the world. What can I do? Paul would say, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. He tells us that we are to, number one, continue in prayer and number two, as we continue in prayer, we are to watch as we pray. And that word watch there is going to be the, the foundation of this thought of our prayer lives being a constant vigil to watch as we pray. We continue in prayer and we watch as we pray. How many of you, when you pray, go through the same exact things that you say every time with no thought of the actual circumstances around you? Watching as we pray means that we are to be intentional and that what we say to God in prayer is a result of what we see in the world as we are praying. The person that watches when he prays is paying attention. And because he's paying attention, that which he asks God for is very specific. He's praying with focus. He's praying with intent. Now, so many times, and, and I don't fault people for this, but you'll see it a lot on social media and in prayer requests. I have a silent prayer request that I want to offer. And what that means is the situation is one that I don't want to tell people about. But might I say that I can't silently pray or unspokenly pray for your request, I need to know specifically what to pray for. You know, if you say, I have an unspoken prayer request, Lord be with them, I might be thinking you have cancer praying along those lines when you're really dealing with depression. If you have a problem, tell me specifically how I can pray, and I will pray for you every single day of that week. And I will pray, and I will pray, and I will pray. 
I need to know specifically what I pray for. Watch and pray. We are to continue in prayer, and we're to watch as we pray. As I was meditating on this today, and it was one because of this past week, I said, Lord, i got to skip to this passage. And I've thought about it for hours every day this week. Yesterday, you can ask my wife, she probably thought I was sick or depressed because I sat in my chair for like 12 hours. I didn't talk. She kept making me do chores. I saw a meme, and it said, if you ever think your wife doesn't pay attention to you, just sit down and get comfortable, and suddenly she will pay attention to you. I'm thinking, and I'm meditating, and I'm thinking, and I'm meditating, and all I can think about is the news is on, and it's bad news, and it's terrifying, and it's scary, and it's unsettling, and uncertain, and you have no idea what's going to happen. All I can think of is, Lord, may we watch and pray. God, intervene. God, help me know what to say to these people because everybody's thinking about that no matter what you did this week, no matter what you thought this morning. That was on your mind. I know it was. I know it was. God, what can I say to them that's going to give them not only peace but also instruction in the face of such an event as this? And I just thought this is one of the most important Sundays for me to get up in a pulpit and talk to God's people in a long time. What does God's word exhort us? And here we are in our series on Colossians, and the answer's right there. Why do you go through books of the Bible, Ben? Why not just pick topics? Because it's relevant today. Continue in prayer and watch. This describes that the Christian experiences both collectively and individually one continuing prayer vigil. What's a prayer vigil? How many of you have participated in a vigil? A lot of times that's something that we see in our communities when there's a great tragedy. And mark my word, just begin to expect it. If something happens and what we see over in Europe flies out of control, we'll be here that night. It will be here that day. And I'm going to invite you. And I'll be here every day of the week as the community needs a place to come together and pray because that's what churches ought to be doing. This place is not to be a Sunday-only facility. But when there's a need like that, we can come together and we can pray. Oh, I can pray from home, sure, but let me tell you, there's something special when God's people gather to pray. Christianity, because of this verse, is to be one perpetual prayer vigil. You think about it, as the world rotates, you have people that wake up, you have people that do their business, they go to work, they come home, they eat, they have recreation, and as the time zones move around the world, as the world rotates and the, you know, from our perspective, the sun makes one trip across the sky, you have going around the world, alternating in time, everyone's day at a different rate. I want you to think about this because it really gave me something to meditate on. At all times around the world, Christians are going through the cycle of prayer. At every moment in human history, someone is praying to God. As the world turns, you say, I can't stay up 24 hours a day, several days in a row. No, but as you rest, someone else picks up the baton. Someone else takes that mantle and they begin to pray. And as the faithful leave the recreation, the distraction, the discouragement, the anger, the hostility, the screaming, and they lock themselves into the prayer closet, and they begin to pray. You have this continual vigil, as it were, going around the world, continuing at all times as the faithful lift up their hands in prayer to God. What's a prayer vigil? We see those in times of catastrophe when churches come together and they pray. Communities come together and they pray. I don't know how the concept of lighting a candle and holding it up entered into the equation, but sometimes that happens. I guess in our modern day and age, we can turn the lights on and turn the smartphone flashlights on. That's really immaterial. It doesn't add anything to it. It doesn't take anything away from it. It certainly doesn't add anything to it. A vigil is when one remains awake in a time that he or she would be sleeping to either watch or to pray. And according to this verse, the saints of God are to pray, and as they pray, watch. Your life is to be a prayer vigil. 
And when you have every single person who names the name of Christ around the world praying throughout their day as they watch and pray with determination and focus and intent, literally, literally the events of time begin to change. And God hears and he responds and he blesses and he gives and he delivers He intervenes in the course of human history. Emphasizing prayer is so crucial in our lives. I want you to think of it in the same light that you would eating every day and breathing every moment. It's a necessity like sleep and exercise and proper nutrition, not only for personal reasons, obvious personal reasons, but for the benefit of all people who live here in the world. Regarding this, and I like this statement from his commentary, Joel Beakey wrote, for the Christian, prayer is absolutely vital. Vital has reference to life. When you go to the hospital and someone takes your vital signs, they're making sure you're alive. We don't want zombies in the ER. He has no pulse and he's walking. Call the CDC. You know, this is 2022, right? 2020, 2020.1, 2020 TOO, 2022. At this point, maybe I wouldn't be so surprised. Zombies are now in the ER. Take their vital signs. Vitality is your life force, strength of living. Prayer for the Christian is vital. Absolutely vital, B, he says. Believers ought to give heed to their prayers, seeking to guard and protect the duty of prayer so as not to neglect it, but to continue in it. Prayer should be thoughtful and intentional. In other words, we must pray. We must pray. And as we pray, we pray specifically for the needs and the dangers in the world today. Now, as we think about the importance of prayer, this is why Jesus taught the disciples before he was arrested, before he was crucified. Matthew chapter 6, uh, 26 and verse 41, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's not referring to his flesh, but their flesh. Just a few moments from then, they would fall asleep as he prayed all night prior to his arrest, before his crucifixion. All night he prays, sweating as it were great drops of blood in agony, understanding what's about to happen to him upon the cross. What a hideous thought that was. And he was understanding all of it. But he tells his disciples to watch and pray. What ought we to do as we continue in prayer and watch therein too? We watch and we pray. We watch and we pray. Continual prayer vigil. Prior to his passion, he prays all night, and he tells his disciples to do likewise. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus gave a parable, and this parable is to this end. Luke 18, 1, he spake a parable unto them to this end, for this purpose, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. What happens when one faints? Well, if any of you have ever struggled with fainting, you know what happens. You fall asleep. A person who's fainted isn't conscious. They're not aware. They're not paying attention. Pray always and not to faint. Now, in this parable he gave is the parable of the unjust judge. And there's another purpose of this parable to teach that God will judge those who afflict his children, and he hears the prayers of his children. In this parable of the unjust judge, you have a poor widow woman who was afflicted by people, and she comes to an unjust judge, and she bothers him, and she bothers him, and she bothers him. Day in and day out, she comes to him, she complains, she complains. And not because he's just, not because he cares, but simply by virtue of the fact that he's tired of her annoying him. He gives in to what she says and he avenges her. That reminds me of some of my children. 
I have one in particular that knows if she asked me about 400 times, at about the 415th time, I'm finally tired of hearing it, and I'll give in, just please make it stop. <laughs> she goes, because <laughs> she, know, she knows, <laughs> she's persistent. I said, honey, you're going to grow up and be a lobbyist in Washington. Because you, you really can get what you want when you're that persistent. Bless your heart. This woman pesters this judge so much, and he's not even just. He doesn't care. He finally gives in just to make her stop. Jesus taught that parable, again, to communicate these two points, that God, will, God who is not unjust, will avenge his children. But he begins it with this statement. The narrator, Luke, tells us he spake this parable to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. A continual prayer vigil. A continual prayer vigil. As Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, he wrote a short statement. You probably can all quote it. It's three simple words. Say it with me if you know it. Pray without ceasing. Now we're primitive Baptists. We nod couple of you said it with me. You could say it again. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Does that mean that literally every moment of my life, my brain, my intellect can be engaged in petitioning God in my prayers? No. I understand that I can only think about one thing at a time. Rachel thinks I can think about more than one thing at a time. And so I'll be doing something and she'll talk to me and my mind is such that when it locks in on a thought, I cannot stop. I cannot derail. It's a one-track mind. That means it cannot be derailed. And she'll come up and tell me something and I'm typing away in an email, theological discussion or a prayer request or answering somebody or something and I'm intently engaged and after about 30 seconds, you're not listening to a thing I said. I can't think on two things at once. And I was doing this one first, and, and sometimes I get distracted, and I'll start looking at something and thinking about something, and she's still talking, and I have to make up the parts I missed in my head so she doesn't get mad at me and yell at me. And she's laughing because she knows this is true. One track mind. I cannot think about two things at once. When I am writing bills or producing a radio program or giving a trumpet lesson, or playing a gig, I might not be able to focus on praying at every single moment of my life. And Paul knows that. God knows that. That's not his intent. His intent is to, me, uh, to communicate that you and I ought to always be about praying. And so when you're driving down the road, before you eat your meal, maybe intermittently through this sermon, just say a little prayer, God bless him. As you drive to church on Sunday morning, as you're headed to work, Lord, help me this day. As you get to a new task at the workplace, Lord, help me to get this done. Continually throughout the day, our lives are to be lives of prayer. Our minds are to be engaged in prayer. We're to be praying people. Pray without ceasing. Now, to be very clear, when Jesus warned against those who stood on the street corner and prayed, he also talked about those with this sort of vain repetition that would just sit there and say the same thing over again, thinking that through much speech they would be heard more than if they simply asked it once. And so they might look up and say, God do this, God do this, God do this, God do this, and they think they're heard for their much speaking. We have to balance this thought with that as well. They thought they were heard for their much speaking. We think we're heard because we pray through the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ to God the Father who rules and reigns. But that doesn't mean that we don't continually engage in prayer. There are very short prayers in the Bible that were just as powerful as the lengthy prayers. But that doesn't mean lengthy prayers are bad. Again, pray always, never to faint, continuing prayer, watching thereunto. What we do about these terrifying situations is we pray. Saints, we have an opportunity now to pray for something that is a very serious need in our world. We live in this world. We're not disconnected from this world. We're in it, we're not of it, but we're in it nonetheless. 
And so these passages give us the importance of continuing in prayer, and this importance cannot be overemphasized. The believers of the world are to so persevere in prayer that a continual prayer vigil occurs at all time, at all times through the world. And as we begin to think about the great threats that we see around us in the world today, when calamity strikes, and by the way, calamity will strike, what did Jesus teach in the uh, Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25? Before his coming, there will be what and rumors of what? Wars and rumors of wars. Another thing he says, earthquakes, floods, famines, pandemics, because we live in a sin-cursed world. This is why I believe that, well, I say I don't talk about politics. It's why you need the right to defend yourself. It's why you need the right to defend yourself. There will never be a utopia because government and police are so strong that there are not wicked people that can't hurt you. You need the right to defend yourself because evil people do evil things and you are their target. Nothing demonstrates that more than an invading military, right? When calamity strikes, our response before any other action should be immediately to prayer. We go to prayer. We go to God and we pray. We beg Him. We beseech Him. We petition Him. Believers respond to trouble with prayer. Now, I want to demonstrate this from just a few passages. And I said this is one we're going to hit a lot of examples and move quickly. Every one of these examples could be a sermon in and of itself. When John the Baptist was murdered by Herod, why was John the Baptist murdered by Herod? John had been in prison because he went before Herod and told him it was unlawful to have his brother's wife. Now, there were many Herods. There was Herod the Great, then you have the Tetrarchs, and you have all of these different men who were a part of this family, Idumeans, part of Esau, part of allegedly Jacob's lineage. John the Baptist goes before him and he tells him, it's not lawful for you to have this woman that you have taken from your brother to be your wife, and he imprisons him. He would have killed him, but he feared the people because they counted him a prophet. And so his wife now gets her daughter to provocatively dance for him so that he will fall for her so he can say, I'll give you whatever you want. And so she asks for John the Baptist's head in a box. I want you to kill this man of God. I don't like what he said. And by the way, if you want to know what the role of the pastor is in government, there it is when they are in sin and they have violated God's law, to stand before them, look them in the eye and say, you are wrong. We don't waste our time talking about issues that don't have to do with that morality in the ministry. But when there's an issue like abortion or redefining marriage or murdering people who are innocent, we look them in the eye and we say, this is sin. And we do it unapologetically, standing on the word of God and the power of God through the Holy Spirit. It is sin, it is wrong, and we declare it as such. John the Baptist is beheaded for this. He's beheaded. You read the story of that early in John chapter 14. The disciples came and took the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. Now, you might wonder, why does Jesus go after the death of his cousin, his forerunner, the voice crying in the wilderness who prepared the way of the Lord, a man that he said is among women, there's never been born one greater, the man who baptized him. When this happens, Jesus goes to a desert place apart. Why does Jesus do that? We don't get the answer until a few verses later. As Jesus goes to the mountain place apart, what happens so often in his ministry happens again. As he went forth, he saw a great multitude, and he's moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. He's going to be alone for a reason, and he's interrupted by ministering to people. But even in this moment of calamity, 
Jesus doesn't turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to them. He ministers to them. He has compassion on them because many of his children are in this group. They're coming to him wanting food and healing. And so oftentimes these multitudes are absolutely full of his sheep and he loves them and he cares for them. This continues. You have the loaves and the fishes. He feeds them. They ate. All of this ends. Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him to the other side. Conjecture, everywhere these men go, people see, they know who they are, they know that Jesus is with them. Jesus sends the twelve off in a ship, but Jesus goes alone. This gives us the setting up of Jesus walking on water and calming the sea. Jesus, when he had sent the multitudes away, listen to what he did, went up into a mountain apart to pray. This is God incarnate in a moment of calamity when a person he loved had been murdered for being faithful to the word of God. And Jesus goes into a mountain alone to pray. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God incarnate, the word made flesh, went into solitude to pray to God, Don't you think in moments of calamity we need to hit our knees and pray as the first response and not the last-ditch effort? We need to pray. When things in this world fly out of control, you and I need to stop. We need to pray. In the book of Acts chapter 12, the apostle Peter is arrested. James, the brother of John, is beheaded by one of these Herods. Again, there were many men named Herod. Some in the Bible are given by their name, not the word Herod. Herod stretches forth his hand to vex the church. He kills James, the brother of John, with the sword. Because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Peter's arrested, but you know, God miraculously intervenes, releases Peter... Peter goes on his way. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 12, when he had considered the thing, Peter that is, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. He knocks on the door. And you know what they say? It's, it's got to be an angel or a spirit or something because he's in jail. How can it be? They don't believe the poor woman that answers the door. And she doesn't open it to let him in. It's actually kind of funny if you think about it. But notice what the church is doing. One of the most regarded ministers, one of the original 12, has been arrested. And what the church does in response is to gather and pray. Now, we send prayer requests all week. You know, if something happens, we sent one out a couple of days ago. If something happens, we give a prayer request digitally. You get it in your phone, bleep, 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 smartphone. Okay, I've got an email from this side of the world. Because we live in this instant communication age, but there's something special when the church comes together. Collective prayer is special. We were talking about it in a preacher group the other day. In Acts 4, when the apostles come together after their first dose of persecution, collectively they pray and God shakes the earth to let them know that he had heard them. An earthquake in response to prayer. The church is to collectively pray. Individual prayer we must do. But collective prayer is a tool that we have as well. Our first response is to petition God, as we've emphasized. Why is that? Two statements from James. First of all, we have not because we ask not. That means that there are things that we could have individually as a church or as a society that we do not have because we simply fail to ask. We can see this in the lives of people after David sinned with Bathsheba, God makes a statement, what I had not have given you other things that you even wanted. And you've gone and stolen a man's you lamb, as it were. God is pleased to give his children things when they ask. He would make the statement, Jesus, in his ministry, which one of you fathers, when your child asks for an egg, gives him a scorpion? No. God is pleased to give what his children ask for. If it be in accordance with his will, now if I say, God, I really want a million dollars in a Ferrari, he's probably going to say, son, you don't need a million dollars in a Ferrari. 
but I'd really like a million dollars in a Ferrari. You don't need a million dollars in a Ferrari, okay? But there's a lot of things in this world that I can pray for, and if it's in accord with God's will, God will answer and He will give. Whatever we ask in His Son's name, which is why we end our prayers with in Jesus' name, amen. We have not because we ask not, and at the same time, the flip side of that coin, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We know that when we pray, what we pray for avails much because God hears and God answers our prayers. Now, there are three senses that I want to apply this, the benefits of praying, the reason that we pray. As we have not because we ask not in the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I want to begin at the macro and go to the micro. What we mean by that is we want to take a zoomed out approach and look at God's blessing of prayer. Prayer doesn't work, please hear me out, because prayer is magic, okay? These aren't spells, these aren't incantations. You don't have inherent power in you to think positive thoughts and vibes and impact the world around you. You see that on social media a lot? I'm sending positive vibes. And I'm always picturing somebody going, what? Positive vibes? What does that do? It doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. Prayer works because there's a God who hears and a God who answers. That's why prayer works. First of all, since number one, the prayers of the saints benefit society in general. Society is better because God's people pray. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, as Jesus begins to, and this is his first sermon in, in Matthew's gospel, as he begins to speak about the importance of the church in the world, what does he tell them? You're the light of the world and you're the salt of the earth. That's very specific language, and the people of that day knew exactly what he referred to. We give light as we illuminate, as we teach the Word, but we're also the salt of the earth. Salt in that day is a preservative. Now, it's a flavor. You're the savor, the flavor of this world. You're what makes it a beautiful place in the eyes of God. What a thought is that? But salt was a preservative. And interestingly enough, if it was good for nothing, if it had lost its savor, if it wasn't salt worth keeping, the Romans would use it to line the roads so that the weeds would die and people could pass on the roads. I saw a funny meme the other day. It had a picture of a road in Rome today. And it had a picture of a road in Georgia today. And the road in Rome looked better than the road in Georgia. And I thought, boy, that's so true, isn't it? That's so true. Insider secret, there are actually forms of asphalt that would last a lot longer, but for job security, they don't use it. How do I know that? Because I was a land surveyor for 10 years, and for eight of those years, I did road construction. Don't tell anybody I told you. Trade secret. It gives people that do that something to do. Salt was used to kill the weeds and to maintain the roads. But as a preservative, salt is packed around meat, and it keeps the meat from rotting away. You keep human culture from rotting into the depravity, into the filth and the decadence that it could devolve into without your presence and without your prayers. The church is described as salt because... There's a preserving effect that saints have on society when they beg God in their prayers. Now, this is obviously true collectively. Do you remember in the book of Exodus when the children of Israel were being afflicted by Pharaoh? And God, when he speaks to Moses, he says, Their cries have come up before me in heaven. There's a collective calling out to God, which is by definition prayer, that the children of Israel were engaged in. They're praying to God, and God hears. Does he hear that day? Well, he heard, but did he answer that day? No, he didn't answer that day. He didn't answer that week. He didn't answer that month, and he did not answer that year. 
But in his time, according to his will, when the fullness of the time was come, as it were, he heard, he intervened, he delivered, and he judged. And we find that pattern throughout human history. Today is no exception. Prayer is not an instant remedy to the problems that we face. This is true collectively, when people collectively come, but it's also true individually. The book of James chapter 5. James says a lot about prayer. I would encourage you to read it in your time this week. James chapter 5, verse 17, Elias or Elijah was a man subject to like passions as are we. We look at the saints of the Old Testament as super saints, superheroes with abilities and morale that we don't have and that's not true. He was subject to like passions as are we. He was a man, just like we're men. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. One man's prayer, and God withheld rain for three and a half years as a judgment upon King Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel, who caused God's people to sin and afflicted the true prophets of God. Read the story of Elijah while you're at it with your homework. Elijah was a man subject to like passions like we are. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not. The prayers of the saints benefit society in general, whether collectively or individually. And lastly, concerning the benefits of prayer in society... And this is probably one of the most important things that I'm going to tell you today. So pay attention, please, and put this in your heart. Bury this word in your mind. When a Christian prays for their leaders, which is a command and a duty and obligation to God, praying has a real effect on our leaders. And this effect works for the benefit of all of us. I complain a lot about elected officials. I know I'm alone in that, right? If I devoted the words that I have said in complaint about every one of the last few presidents, if I had devoted those same words to prayer, what might it have been? Sort of the most tragic concepts to think on as a thought experiment, what might have been, what could have been. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, that is all types of men, for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. What is it that we are to pray for? That they would have wise decision-making. That God would open their eyes to His Word and His sovereignty and His will in this world. That He would break their hearts. That He would expose their own sinfulness before Him in their eyes and cause them to hit their knees in humility and to cry out unto Him for wisdom and instruction You get a man in office in any country at any time that fears God and sees himself for what he is, and you'll have a man that's a blessing to that people. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. We pray for kings and all that are in authority, for police officers, for city councilmen, for commissioners, for mayors, for governors, for representatives and senators, for vice president and for president. We pray for them that they would know what is right and know what is wrong so that we might live a quiet and peaceable life. i got a dear friend, and if you mention this around, I pray for him, I pray every day that God strikes him dead. Well, you know there's a place for imprecatory psalms, but repent, dear sir, because your heart is not right before God. Pray that God would knock him to his knees. And by him, I mean any of them. Any of them. All of them. 
We have this role and responsibility in human society to pray for those in authority so that God's children can live a quiet and peaceable life. What's God's will for your life? We, we think it's grandeur, right? To be the Superman, the hero, to sign up for elaborate trips and turn the world upside down, as it were. I love to point out, Mama's God's will for your life is to be a good mama living a quiet and peaceable life at home. Husbands, to love your wife and love your kids. To be the servant of Christ into your home. To, to be the master or the servant that you ought to be, whether employee or employer, to be a good, godly, quiet, peaceable person wherever it is that God has planted you in this world. And praise God it's here because there's no place I'd rather be. And as we do that, we have a salt effect on human society. Number two, going from macro to micro, as Christians pray, our prayers have an effect on the saints. I want to set you on fire with prayer. As we pray, we can pray for the personal growth of every single person who worships with us here at Flint River. Do you realize we can pray for one another's growth? Have you grown since you've been here? Have you learned things you did not know? I hope you've grown today. If I thought I was merely telling you something you already knew, I'd go somewhere else. But I hope that you've learned something that you've been exhorted to good works. We pray for your personal growth. So many times my Mondays I start with, Lord, be with the people of Flint River this week. Help them to be disciples today and disciples this week. Deliver them from the evil. Keep them in your name, I pray, and amen. I pray for you. I pray for you. I pray for you. We pray for personal growth. We pray... For healing from sickness. We had one surgery this week and other news that we've learned off from some health issues and we've prayed for that. There are long-standing health issues that we pray for regularly. There are family members and friends that are in your circle of life that we pray for. We pray for your health. And how many times have we seen God answer and bless with healing? from cancers and strokes and heart problems and other illnesses. I want you to think about what would have happened if nobody prayed. If we have not because we ask not, and the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, what would have happened if we had not prayed? Well, maybe God would have been merciful. But maybe not. Maybe he wouldn't have been because no one asked him to be. No one asked him to intervene. Don't you tremble at that thought from the problems that we've seen in the health sense here in our congregation? But because you prayed, God heard, God answered, God intervened to God be all the glory and the honor and the praise. We pray, as we'll see next week, for open doors to evangelize and share God's word. We pray for opportunities to minister and God blesses them as the saints with opportunities to minister. Lastly, regarding the benefits of prayer, bringing it to the micro, prayer benefits us personally. Both of these points from Matthew chapter 6 and the model prayer, what does Jesus say? How does he teach us to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. As we pray to God, God hears and he blesses us individually and personally with our needs. Lord, I need a job. I pray to you for a job, God blesses with the job. Lord, I pray for a spouse, God blesses with the spouse. God, I pray for clarity on this issue, God blesses with clarity on this issue. Our individual needs are met. Number two, and I close with this on purpose, we pray to God and He delivers us from evil individually. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That evil can be taken in two senses. First of all, personal sin and opportunities to do that which is folly. It's sinful, displeasing to the Lord. But so many times in Scripture, the word evil communicates the idea of calamity. Dear God, deliver us. From calamity. 
Deliver us from global conflict. Deliver our children from going to war to fight. Deliver people who are being attacked by madmen wherever they are. Deliver us from the wickedness that we engage in as a country. Deliver us from the judgment that I know that we deserve in America. Deliver us, Lord, as your people from evil. As our world stands on the brink of war and unthinkable death flaring up at any moment with the slightest spark, our responsibility as followers of Christ, what can I do? Our responsibility is to pray. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you, Lord, today in the midst of trouble and uncertainty, and it seems like those words have been on our tongues for now more than two years We know, Lord, that this is par for the course in a sin-cursed world, and if we had periods of decades of ease and peace and prosperity, we know that that is an enigma in human history because we live in a world marred by sin, cursed by depravity and suffering and sickness and death and murder and assault and war and abuse. Lord, we long for a day when we're delivered from this present evil world to be with you in glory where there will be no more calamity, there will be no more destruction, there will be no more war. The final war will be ended by you as you vanish, as you send all of your enemies, as it were, into the lake of fire, as you vanquish them, I should say, as they're cast away from your presence forever to be judged for what they've done. But Lord, we know that we live here and we see things that struggle, that cause us to struggle with fear and uncertainty now. And so, Father, we pray for our president. We pray for our Congress. We pray for the representatives and the senators who have the the right to declare war legally in our country. We pray for the president of all of the free countries of the world that are now on the verge of making a, a decision as to the interaction over this troubling situation in Europe even at present. We pray that you give them wisdom and discernment to know what to do. May we never shy away from standing up for that which is right, but might we always look for the opportunity for peace. And so we pray for the hearts of those leaders that would desire war, that you humble them and break their heart, cause them to desire to live peacefully with their fellow man and not to afflict We don't understand everything that happens in this world. We are no experts on this. We are not able to handle the omniscience that you have. It is too great for us to know. But Lord, you know. Your eyes behold. You know why things happen. And Lord, according to thy will, thou knowest what ought to happen. And so, Father, we pray that you intervene, grant wisdom and discernment, and deliverance. Forgive us of our sins, we pray, and we say together, Amen. Praise God from whom all